This is your reality check. Welcome to The Reality Check, the weekly Canadian show that explores a wide range of controversies and curiosities using science and critical thinking. Today is December 5th, 2020, and I'm producer Pat. Today we'll be throwing the whole show over to Darren and Adam. Darren asks the question, is there a loneliness epidemic? And Adam looks into the village effect. While a lot of recent shows have been panelists recording in isolation, the guys were together during this recording. That said, the two segments were not originally intended to be part of the same show. As is the case with most TRC segments, we don't really discuss what a panelist will be talking about in much depth ahead of time, and it turns out that these two segments have similar themes, so we thought it'd be interesting to put them together on the same show. And with that, I hope everyone out there is staying safe and healthy, and we will talk to you soon. The Village Effect is a 2014 nonfiction book by Susan Pinker. The book has different subtitles in various regions, one of which is How Face-to-Face Contact Can Make Us Healthier, Happier, and Smarter, a bold claim which as I will discuss, I think is well supported by the book. Now, I originally read this a few months after it was released in early 2015 as part of Darren's book club, though Darren was traveling for this one, so he was not involved. Yes, back in 2015, I believe. Yeah. I really appreciated the book at the time. The author repeatedly uses evidence-based reasoning to make her point, and I was very convinced by the premise. The ideas in this book really changed my worldview on the benefits of social contact, and the risks of loneliness, which I think many people either don't realize or don't take too seriously. I wanted to talk about some aspects of this book for years, but didn't really get around to it, and given the current COVID-19 pandemic, it seemed like a good time to reinvestigate the book. There are a lot of converging points being made in this book, most of which center around this idea that face-to-face social interactions and having a strong network of close friends and family is concretely important for a person's well-being throughout their entire life from birth, childhood, adulthood, all the way to a person's final years. As Susan Pinker cites countless studies throughout the work, often epidemiological studies, basically analysis of data and patterns in population, often relating to health, to draw some inference about some behavior or activity and its bearing on some outcome, such as health or life expectancy. Now, this kind of thing can often be tough given the idea that correlation does not equal causation. Is there some third factor causing the two things that seem to be linked, but they aren't? Or is the cause actually the effect? Now, she is keenly aware of this and cites studies which control for this as much as possible. So that's the stuff we like, the data and evidence-driven proof supporting the ideas. But she's also a very compelling writer as she splices in interesting personal stories of people she knows or interviewed to give a personal example to support this idea, which also is supported by the data. Susan Pinker previously wrote The Sexual Paradox, Men, Women, and the Real Gender Gap, which looked at numerous reasons for disparities in gender when it comes to work, school, and life in general. Now, I read that book later, though it was published earlier. It's also great and had a similar style where where compelling data is mixed in with interesting stories to make that point. Now, we aren't robots, and so people are generally more convinced by a nice story than cold, hard facts, so I appreciate when we have both. So no one's trying to to trick us. They're not trying to pull one over. Here's the data, but I want it to cement in your brain, so here's a nice story to wrap it up. Well, to be fair, you could say, yes, it's a smart communicative tool. Yeah. People tend to like narratives and they're very subject to falling for anecdotes. We don't want that to be the case. So she backs it up (laughs) with data and it's idea to have the anecdote showcase what the data indicates. But if one thought she was being more nefarious, you could say, well, maybe the data is not as rigorous as you'd hope. And then the anecdote makes people think it is. And therefore you come away thinking things are more plausible or supported than they actually are. Yeah. So to me, um, You know, I think long term, some of the numbers, they don't stay with me, but some of the stories do. So as long as when I'm reading it, they match and and I can sort of consciously realize that they match, then I I, I believe this um, this nugget of information, um, but it stays with me thanks to it. So I think it's a good strategy to to help people. Uh, So I guess I agree with you. Uh, It's good for things that are more likely to be true. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) And it's bad for things that are not. And that's the problem. Yes. So I happen to, at the time make the analysis that I believe it to be true. Therefore I I trust it. Right. And maybe not everyone thinks in the same way I do, but uh, it, it worked for me. Right. So what exactly is this book trying to say? Now, one recurring theme throughout the book is that women are better at relationships than men. Women live longer than men, and Pinker believes that this is the primary reason for it. 
women make a bigger effort to create and maintain close social relationships, mainly with other women, which has a number of positive benefits. Men, on the other hand, will often have a large number of more shallow relationships, which have benefits, but not the main benefits that are explained in the book. Many men will only have one close relationship, that being their spouse, which puts them in a risky position where they are one person away from having, well, no one, which can lead to older widowed men being in a particularly bad situation, elevated risk of dying in the next year after their spouse dies and things like this. So what are these benefits to close relationships and what's the mechanism? Well, health and longevity are a big one, as is explained time and time again. It may seem odd at first because it seems like this sort of is this fuzzy thing and the numbers might not be that high, but they really are. The numbers really are striking. There's a five to seven year gap in life expectancy between men and women, for example. Some studies suggest that strong social bonds can cause a person to live 15 years longer. There are a lot of data points like this throughout the book that really drill this point home. Well, some of this is due to the body reacting to social contact, having lower stress hormones and effects like this. Some of it is actually actually very practical. So she gives an example of a man who needed a kidney transplant and due to his large network of close friends had a number of volunteers. Even something as simple as having someone check in on you can make a big difference. For example, in a natural disaster, hurricane, forest fire, tsunami, heat wave, something like that, having people you can rely on can mean the difference between life and death in the situation. Pandemic. Or pandemic, exactly. Um, medical assistance in some situations uh, can make a big difference. Uh, even like, you know, having a spouse that harasses you to uh, go to your medical appointments and things like this, or mm-hmm. even, even mm-hmm. bring you to them. Now, the flip side is also true that loneliness kills. Now, this is a state that has a strong negative impact on a person. Pinker states that a lack of social contact is as bad as smoking a pack of cigarettes a day when it comes to risk of hypertension. People with less social contact have more trouble recovering from mild illnesses like colds, as well as serious illnesses, including cancer. Now, it's not to say that having friends is a magical cure to these things, but strong social bonds will fortify a person to increase their recovery times and things like that. And again, with practical examples, a person with close social bonds may be well poised to learn about a good oncologist if they have cancer or have a good support structure to have uh, someone to bring them to their appointments and things like that. So the data shows the benefits, but there are many possible reasons for that benefit. And she does explore a lot of those possible reasons. I can't help but think about the current pandemic in that sense. Social isolation is a big part of the pandemic. So from what some people are saying, it seems to be a suggestion that uh, face-to-face contact uh, is a sort of luxury and it's a nice to have, but you don't really need it and your health is more important. In reality, your health does depend on social contact. And inversely, the loneliness caused by pandemic-related isolation can have a negative impact on your health and recovery, even due to something like COVID-19. Now, I'm not able to compare the risk of infection to the benefits of social contacts, right? So I'm not going to go and recommend you should have social contacts to have your health improve because that kind of thing could cause much worse things. I wish I was able to do that analysis. I'm not equipped to do it. So much to say, I just would hope that the health authorities are factoring in the benefits of social interaction into their models going along with the risks because um, it's, it's a factor that I think people need to consider. Now, Susan Pinker talks a lot about technology in this book. It was written in 2014. It's already a bit dated in this sense just because things change so quickly. Laptops and other screens are mentioned, but tablets are a newer thing which are mentioned, but in the six years since they've become much more prominent, especially amongst younger children. The advice she she gives does apply to both anyway. First is this idea of the internet paradox. It's not her idea, and it's one that has been looked at by many others. And basically, the more online people are, the less time they spend with friends, family, and colleagues. While technology is meant to bring us together, it often actually makes people more isolated. And this depends. There are certainly instances where people will use social media to um, have a better contact with their friends. There's ways to use it in good or bad ways. So especially in children, the impacts of technology can be very bad at a number of ages. For younger children, TV and other screens, so iPad seems like a likely culprit these days, but that would have been sort of new at the time of writing the book, they can be detrimental, um, likely largely due to this concept called displacement. And I've mentioned this on the show before when we talk about uh, video games, TV, and a lot of other things. It's not that those things are intrinsically bad, but it's that while people are doing them, it's displacing something much more important. In this case, the focus is usually on face-to-face contact. So for for developing toddlers and babies, they need face-to-face time with a parent. They need to be spoken to and interacted with. They need to read and to read with an adult and things like um, sitting at a table and having dinner with 
family members is very important for their development. More so-called screen time reduces this time and therefore can lead to developmental issues, reduced literacy, reduced vocabulary, lower grades, all sorts of social issues later in life. Older children have similar issues, especially when it comes to school, because the displacement is a displacement of their study time, their reading, their schoolwork. If, especially if that technology is in the classroom or in the, in the place where they're working. Mm -hmm. So the book gives scathing criticism of school laptop programs popular in many schools, despite there being no evidence that they work and tons of evidence that they are very bad for learning. One reason is that often the teachers aren't taught to use the technology. So it ends up presenting some challenges and displacement rears its ugly head again, as children and teenagers will prefer to play with their devices than to learn on them. And I've seen this firsthand seeing a 12 and 14 year old attend a school with iPad learning, hear things like, I was done my homework early, so I did a little bit of YouTube. That kid, he doesn't really listen. He just looks at memes and YouTube on his iPad all the time. So a laptop, or to a much lesser extent, a tablet, can be a tool used for all sorts of amazing things, but they can also be used as tools for easy entertainment and games. This is primarily what they're designed for. People are going to end up using them for that. Generally, children feel more engaged when using a laptop, but this doesn't translate to more learning. They are more drawn to the bells and whistles, which can end up being a distraction. So not only in school, but out of school, the evidence shows that a computer in the home for children and teens can severely reduce school performance as they spend time distracted by what those devices provide. So the internet doesn't seem to help children with their social ties. High internet or phone usage correlates with weaker social skills. Kids are hyper-connected, but extremely lonely. Now, obviously, there are instances where the, the phones can be used to facilitate um, some of those interactions, there are different ways to use them. I was thinking about that and wondered if the effect would be swamped of like, you can imagine that there's no computer in the home. That seems to be disadvantageous, right? Because then you'd only have access like, I don't know, at school or at the library, <laughs> right? And like, but most people probably have multiple computers yeah. at home. And so once you get beyond the one, which could be used for say work, if you have your phone, which would then be the ones used for play, it, but they could see it being negative. All I have to say is when they said, you know, if there's more computers in the home, it's less likely to be positive. Like, well, beyond one, maybe? It depends. Yeah, it depends where the, I guess it depends where it is. It depends what it's used for. Um, and things have certainly changed. Um, I think a lot of parents, parents have this idea that introducing children to technology early will help them. And this is perhaps not the case. And I think maybe it's changed a lot over time. So I think back to my own childhood. So I got a computer at home. I was something like 11 years old. Before that, I liked to play with the computers at school. I was just very keen, very interested with that, in them from a young age. I play things like 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 Logo, right? The turtle that goes around. And it's, it's like math formulas that you're plugging into this thing. And at home, I messed around in, in, in Paint. And eventually, uh, I played writing programs in BASIC and Turbo Pascal and pro programs that would make little games and do all sorts of interesting things. You refute the book, Adam. <laughs> But, but yeah, so I think this was a different time. Maybe this is my own interest that just gravitated towards different things, but just the computer was less distracting than it is now, right? So you give, give, um, give a child a laptop, an iPad, or a phone in the 21st century. It's not really the same experience as I had growing up. Uh, today's pieces of technology are much more user-friendly to the extreme. They're designed to be maximally appealing and therefore addictive. They're easy to use so that there's almost no technical skill being acquired simply by using them. This wasn't necessarily the case back in the 80s or 90s or earlier. A child will not learn to code or do some sort of computer work that one might use in an office by zoning out watching YouTube four hours a day. So there's a, well, there's a different way to use that technology. Yes, I can imagine now this other weird world where they don't have a phone yet. There is just like a laptop or a, you know, a console yep. PC and there's no internet. And now you're like, oh, yeah, well, yeah. now what? what like, would you oh, do on it? <laughs> well, exactly. Like, well, well, what do you do? You're like, what we used to do. <laughs> yeah. You either load a game or you play solitaire or you learn to code. Well, if you had a mod, yeah, if you had a modern computer, you probably still have Minecraft on there. There's probably things, and not Minecraft's probably better than some things people could play. But there's yeah. so there's there's yeah, yeah. there's things you can do. But yeah, for sure, like I had a computer when I was a child. <laughs> But I didn't have the internet no. until I was an adult. Yeah, you didn't so have the world. So this is a very different experience. Yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I'd forgotten this particular section in my first reading, but the book deals a lot with relationships. The importance of a strong marriage is hard to overstate, especially for men. So unmarried women are 50% more likely to die young, while unmarried men are 250% more likely to die young than now, this translates to married women living three years longer and married men uh, living seven years longer. 
This isn't really a subtle difference at all. You know, they, they did all sorts of tests. Married people have lower blood pressure. They sleep better. All sorts of things like this. Now, the flip side being that a bad relationship can be toxic to one's health, with women being more likely to have an adverse physical reaction to a bad relationship. Even recalling a bad relationship is more likely to have a physically detrimental effect on a woman mm. than a man. I also think, I mean, that's, I don't disagree that <laughs> married people are, have different stats like that. It's like, is there the underlying variables that may make you more likely to be married yeah. or to stay married or all these sorts of things? Yeah. So there's a lot of factors. And I can't get in all of this here, yep. but, but she, um, She's aware of those. She mentions them and attempts to find studies that compensate for them. But some of the times when she randomly throws out a stat, that may not be controlled for, right? Now, the book also talks about dating and dating sites, amongst other things. Uh, she mentions that no algorithm is better than chance. So the sites that try to match you up with someone compatible is pretty much all pseudoscience. If you tell someone they're a match, they'll believe it. And that can help. But that doesn't mean that the computer did anything useful. Compatibility is determined by non-verbal rapport, which isn't something which can be determined by an app. Well, not yet. Mm. And, and matching interests does not predict long-term success in a relationship, though sometimes it helps uh, for the start. The key indicator of a successful relationship is the ability to problem solve and have fun when face-to-face, -face. not something you can necessarily get by texting or in an app. Um, but she does say that it is useful to... Um, Remove potential non-starters. You might tell right away this person's a bad match for X or Y reason. Finally, there was some interesting data on socializing at work. It seems that face-to-face -face socializing in an office setting boosts productivity significantly. There's an example of a call center where they space the shifts differently to have non-staggered breaks, allowing staff to socialize more during their break time. And this increased productivity. Mm. So having staff who are willing to interact face-to-face -face or even on the phone with clients makes a big difference as well in a company's ability to succeed. So that, that personal angle seems to be very important. Um, having people work together face-to-face -to -face has value. And again, I look at this in the context of the pandemic where so many people are working remotely, doing a decent job, keeping things going. Um, but I think a lot of people are really liking the advantages of working from home, but maybe ignoring some of the costs because they like those advantages so much. Communicating via email has a limited ability to get the same work done. Obviously, we have good reasons to be limiting face-to-face -face contact right now, but I think these things need to be kept in mind. So people are starting to talk about the new normal and looking at maintaining some of these practices which are going on pretty much indefinitely with either partial or full-time work from home for some employees once the health situation is no longer a risk. Is this really the best way to be productive? And is this really the best way to be happy and healthy? Now, I'll admit I'm not able to be completely objective on this issue, but I suspect a lot of people like the idea of working from home and think that things are going really well, but they may not be realizing those costs. So the significant reduction in face-to-face -face interactions has a real cost to people, which some people may not just be consciously aware of. And many introverts claim to be okay with the pandemic as it allows to avoid social situations, but introverts, just like anyone else, are negatively affected by loneliness and reap the, reap the many benefits of face-to-face -face social interactions with strong networks of friends. So these problems are more likely to affect men who are simply less likely to go out of their way to forge and maintain those relationships, but they are just as susceptible to their strengths and benefits. So just because you think you don't need <laughs> socializing doesn't mean you're immune to it. And maybe maybe you, you don't need as much of it, but it's still important. Well, there's also this other variable that mm -hmm. uh, working from home, you may be less likely to interact with office colleagues, <laughs> but you may be more likely to interact with your family. Right. So there's multiple aspects here. So there's the um, there's the health benefits of actual socializing in general. And some mm. people may only be able to get that or, or a, a main part of that may be work. But there's also the um, idea that the work will benefit from the work colleagues interacting and having uh, stronger relationships and, and just being more effective, right? Well, right. So there's kind so, of two things there. Right. But that's the – there's two possible explanations for that too yep. is that they're just happier because they're more social. Yep. Or they're literally making work connections, which is plausible. Yep. And that trust in the project or the person you're working with, which of course is not as available. Yeah. So there's there's a lot of – you know, there's a lot of factors here. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think – so much of this book ends up being very relevant to what's going on right now, even though it couldn't have been predicted at the time. Um, Susan Picker recently wrote an op-ed in the Globe and Mail, which looked at the lengths which some people are going through to have social interactions during the pandemic. That's worth checking out. And you can find that in the show notes at trcpodcast.com. Great website. Thanks, Darren. Now, the book's conclusion wraps it up with some principles, which I think are worth repeating. 
Principle one, live in a community where you know, talk to your neighbors. Two, build real human contact into your workday. Save email for logistics. Use phone or FaceTime for more nuanced interaction. She doesn't get into the, the kind of technologies, obviously, these days. There's Zoom and MS Teams and all sorts of video conferencing that really change those logistics, right? Uh, three, create a village of diverse relationships. Build in social contact with members of this village the way you work in meals and exercise. She, t- she talks about social interaction like only on the days you eat was, is kind of a comment she makes, right? That's funny. You kind of need it all the time. Four, everyone needs close human contact. Adjust the ratio of your face-to-face to screen communication according to your temperament, just as you adjust how much you want to eat according to your appetite. So, you know, again, some people may not may not want quite as much social interaction as others, and that's fine, but you still need some. Five, make parent, teacher, and peer interaction the priority for preschoolers and young children. Combine live teaching with online tools for older children and teens. So really, you know, I, I was talking a lot about the bad about laptops, but she really puts a focus on like a good teacher can make a huge difference and really engaging um, teaching is really important. Six, As more of our interactions migrate to digital platforms, face-to-face contact in education, medicine, and childcare has become a luxury commodity. As a fundamental human need, it should remain accessible to all. So especially in the pandemic, we're seeing a lot of students learning remotely. And I think some schools are perhaps looking at this as a a cost-saving opportunity Mm -hmm. to remove that in-person education and that in-person uh, face-to-face quality teaching is very important and we we wouldn't want to lose sight of that uh, when things go better. Mm -hmm. So this is just an overview of some key takeaways from the book. I haven't presented much in the way of data backing it up. I assure you is a well-cited book, which uh, I certainly recommend checking out. I think everyone can benefit from reading this book. It's still widely available through bookstores as well as an ebook and audio format. Though it's a few years old at this point, I think it's still very relevant, particularly when considering the current ongoing pandemic. Social ties are important, especially when you have an easy excuse to ignore them like we do these days. Perhaps you've seen the headlines about a loneliness epidemic. The image of an isolated individual comes to mind and thus seems frequent. But is this an accurate depiction of reality or availability bias strikes once again? Today I shall address the question of whether there is a loneliness epidemic. To do so, I think it's best to break up the response into two parts, before COVID-19 and after COVID-19. Oh, well, yeah. (laughs) Yes. Clarifying timelines is important when providing information. So, pre-COVID-19 first. My main source for this section is a great article from Our World and Data, written by Esteban Ortiz Ospina in December 2019, and a related piece by him and Hans Rosen about loneliness and social connections, available at tiercypodcast.com. Great website. As usual, let's clarify our terms. Loneliness is not the same thing as being alone. In some of the literature, social isolation is the term used for aloneness. And this is neither positive nor negative. It just means more time alone, more aloneness. That said, I'll admit when I hear social isolation, it feels negative. Yeah. But that's perhaps just my bias. Loneliness, on the other hand, is the subjective experience of feeling alone. It is this feeling that people generally agree is negative. A lot of the popular misunderstanding of this issue of whether loneliness is increasing comes from conflating loneliness and social isolation. Hmm. Both are important, but they are not the same thing. Heck, I'm sure we can all think of a time when being completely alone was better than being around anyone. (laughs) And here's a quote. In the U.S., the share of adults who live alone nearly doubled over the last 50 years. This is not only happening in the United States. Single-person households have become increasingly common in many countries across the world, from Angola to Japan. Historical records show that this rise of living alone started in early industrialized countries over a century ago, accelerating around 1950. In countries such as Norway and Sweden, single-person households were rare a century ago, but today they account for nearly half of all households. In some cities, they are already a majority. End quote. So it sounds like you're trying to answer the question of whether or not people are lonely, but it seems that people are being alone more often. Correct. And they're not the same thing. And okay. I think some people just assume aloneness is loneliness. Sure. And that's not quite the case. Absolutely. Correlated, not necessarily fully, right? 
This may sound dramatic and all this aloneness shift, uh, so it doesn't mean that there's a loneliness epidemic. When we think about how to assess loneliness, we can ask if different age groups experience more or less loneliness to see if loneliness changes over the life course. Mm -hmm. But we can also ask if different generations feel more or less loneliness. Because you're like, well, is there more loneliness? Well, who are you comparing and to whom? Yeah, and you have to have asked someone 50 years ago. (laughs) Right. This is why it's tricky. Well, it is. It's important to be careful with the comparisons you're making. Yeah. Some say that loneliness is increasing because younger people today are more lonely than older adults. The Our World and Data piece has a breakdown of loneliness by age based on community life survey done in England by the Office of National Statistics. Quote, according to this data, those aged 16 to 24 are the group most likely to report feeling lonely with 10% feeling lonely often or always. In contrast, those aged 65 years and older are the group least likely to report feeling lonely with 3% feeling lonely, often or always. Yeah. Now, many people tend to associate loneliness with older age, so this pattern might seem surprising. But surveys from several other rich countries have found the same. In New Zealand, Japan, and the United States, young adults also report feeling lonely more often than older adults. Note, this is rich countries because some former Soviet countries uh, don't feel this way at all, so be careful of generalizations. But does this mean loneliness is increasing in rich countries? No, because this cross-sectional comparison doesn't look at changes over time. It's just a snapshot. You want to look at individuals over time, as Adam hinted, and separately changes across generations, if you can find them. Mm -hmm. So do we become lonelier as we get older is the follow-up question. So Our World in Data cites data by Louise Hockley in the journal Psychology and Aging that surveys U.S. adults aged 50 years and up, and this is a quote, they found that after age 50, loneliness tends to decrease until about 75, after which it began to increase again, explained by a decline in health and the loss of a spouse or partner. When adjusting for these factors, though, they found that loneliness continued declining into oldest old age. Still quoting, this shows that there are two forces at play. On the one hand, there seems to be a direct relationship between age and loneliness, whereby loneliness decreases with age as our social expectations adapt and we become more selective about relating with contacts who bring positive emotions. On the other hand, there seems to be an indirect association pushing in the opposite direction, whereby loneliness increases with age because our health deteriorates and we lose relatives and friends. Mm -hmm. Given the complex nature of the issue, one must be cautious about making cross comparisons, or at least you can make the cross comparison, but be careful what you infer from it. Mm -hmm. But what we want to know is whether people are more lonely today than they used to be. Of course, which leads to the question, compared to when? 1950? 1850? 1400? (laughs) I'm trying to imagine how things would go if you asked a medieval peasant if they felt lonely at least some of the time. I'm just hungry. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Would the question be meaningful? Would the answer be meaningful? (laughs) So Our World in Data quotes Tom Cheevers and explains this result from the study that was done very well. Quote, Hockley and co-authors found that newer old people, meaning the baby boomers, which were born between 1948 and 1965, Mm. are no more likely to think of themselves as lonely than older old people, born 1920 to 1947, Mm. and that older people have not become more likely to think of themselves as lonely in the last decade, in 2005 to 2016. The average older person appears to be no more likely to be lonely than they were a decade ago. Okay, that's for older adults. What about adolescents? Quote, in the aptly titled paper, Rethinking Generation Me, a study of cohort effects from 1976 to 2006, psychologist Kali Trzniewski and Brett Donnellan used repeated cohort surveys to explore whether successive groups of high school graduates were becoming more lonely in the United States. Hmm. They also found no evidence of cohort trends. Newer generations of high school seniors were not more likely to report feelings of loneliness than earlier generations. Interesting. The psychologists Matthew Clark, Natalie Luxon, and Stephanie Tobin replicated this analysis using the same survey, but they focused on all age groups, not just high school seniors. They have a chart there in our world and data, and they found no signs of increasing loneliness across all age groups. They looked at grade 12, they looked at grade 8, and they looked at grade 7. In fact, they found a very small but statistically significant decline in loneliness for high school students in the United States. Interesting. Now, you wouldn't really notice it much on a, like a properly formatted graph, but it was statistically significant. I'm not saying because I would advocate, of course, there's a decline in loneliness. Sure. It's just that if you have something showing decline, it's a lot harder to argue that there's an increase. <laughs> yes. So while these data are not as comprehensive as I would like, 
it seems fair to say that loneliness does not obviously increase with age, and in fact decreases, that both older people and high school students are not reporting more loneliness than they did 20 to 30 years ago, or even further back. One would think that if there was an epidemic of loneliness, it would be very easy to observe and be consistent in various ways across different sample sizes. That's not what we're seeing. Okay, but what about post-COVID? And what comes to mind? A dramatic drop in socializing for many, but is this actually the case? Or is it more the type of socializing? Meaning if you have a family, you're probably spending even more time with them. Yeah. Of course, one can still feel alone while surrounded by people, so it's important to keep that in mind, again, what the terms mean. So how do we figure this out? To address this question, I found a report by the Ad Council that said that loneliness wasn't increasing during COVID, but risk factors for loneliness were. Mm. Now, I was initially going to be dismissive, like an ad council report. Like, it's, from, it's, 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 it's honestly, it's for media people. And sure. I don't want to be that guy. But I'm like, really? Is this, you know? But I looked at it. They looked at six different countries. They had online surveys, like mm-hmm. 1,000 in each country. They had short interviews. And then they also had detailed interviews with select experts. So it seemed pretty comprehensive. Mm-hmm. That said, another article had the headline, COVID-19 loneliness study reveals significant depressive symptoms in 80% of young adults. There was an online 126 item survey that was carried out between April 22nd and May 11th, but a thousand participants took place. Average age of 28, uh, 86% being over 23, 49% of respondents reported a great degree of loneliness. Now this is much higher than any of the other stuff I mentioned before. Uh, So it's higher than the baseline? Yes. Before, yeah. So before I was saying that that age group, it may be like 10%, 8%. Yeah. Now, this also talked about high degree of anxiety, depression, and substance use among respondents. Yeah. It was published in like the journal of like psychoactive drugs or something like this. So I think they were mainly looking at if you're lonely and stressed out or depressed, are you more likely to take drugs? True. Which of course would make sense. True. But that seemed to be the focus of the report. So I'm like, well, was this as much about loneliness? Hmm. Or maybe you're just more likely to become intoxicated because you don't have to drive anywhere that day. Like, there's, a lot of fa- <laughs> there's a lot of factors, right? Yes, of course. <laughs> Now, additionally, another recent study showed that suicidal ideation was on the rise. Fee.org had this article, quote, researchers at Harvard, Northeastern, Rutgers, and Northwestern universities conducted eight large survey rounds across all U.S. states from April through October, finding that young adults are increasingly having suicidal thoughts. In the U.S. adult population as a whole, the incidence of suicidal ideation typically hovers around 3.4%. But this new study reveals that in October... 37% of young adults had suicidal thoughts compared to 33% in May in the wake of the first round of government lockdowns. Wow. Now, they do say it hovers around 3.4%, so obviously going from 3.4 to something in the 30s is very high. It doesn't quite specify how much it usually is for adolescents, but that's also much higher than we would expect. So there is some jump there. Uh, But this really wasn't specifically about loneliness. And so you can imagine yep. there may be many reasons that suicidal ideation occurs. Yep. Maybe it has to do with employment. Maybe it has to do with stress. There's various other factors. Absolutely. So what to make of all this? Well, specific to COVID, I would say that there is conflicting evidence and it's too soon to tell how much COVID has impacted loneliness. It will be hard to disentangle COVID-caused loneliness from COVID-caused unemployment, general unhappiness due to living through a pandemic, or other possible variables. That said, it does seem clear that mental health is taking a big hit, so there could be interventions to increase mental health regardless of the loneliness issue. Overall, it seems that there was not a loneliness epidemic before COVID, and it currently isn't clear if loneliness has increased a lot because of COVID, because it makes sense that it would have increased at least a little in some populations. So as it relates to, you know, how loneliness is dealt with in the the village effect, the the book which I'd, I'd reviewed... So the author does attempt to look at the question of, you know, when people were asked whether they felt lonely, right? Really more than just whether they live alone. So that 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 factor was there in determining um, that people seem to be more lonely now than they were in the past. Um, But I guess beyond the question of loneliness and obviously the acute effects of loneliness being sort of toxic detrimental to a person um the the flip side is the advantages to those social contacts right so a person may not report being lonely but they may still benefit from having more social contact mm-hmm. that's that's a very different that's a very different question right that's true but this is looking at whether people are experiencing and consciously aware of being lonely Yes. Right. And are there, you know, different reporting effects and who's more likely to say that they're experiencing loneliness, someone who's lonely or someone who isn't and these yeah. sorts of things. I think at a large enough sample, they kind of wash out or sure. don't, uh, don't change this overall stats too much. But, uh, it is interesting that, yes, if you type in loneliness epidemic, 
at least before COVID, you just get all these articles. Yeah. And it's like, based on what? Sure. Everyone thinks it's true? In my segment, I was trying to ask you what comes to mind because this is how people make decisions. You don't usually think about it, but you quickly think of something in your mind, availability bias, does it make sense or not? <laughs> so we're currently living in the most connected age in human history. Yeah. So does that come to mind first? <laughs> that you have more access to anyone you've ever known ever? Yeah. Like, ah, uh, loneliness. Yeah, but some guy was alone on the internet talking to people. <laughs> like, so what do we even mean by these words anymore? So I, I just think it's important to be nuanced and qualified and yeah. to think about the mental imagery that comes to mind when you're trying to think about the likelihood of something being true or not. Yeah, and this is why the question kind of matters and the feeling kind of matters because you can be, you can be in connection with a person while still feeling feeling lonely or still feeling isolated and depends on the quality of that connection or it depends depends on how what it what it's doing for you for show notes or to discuss this episode visit our facebook page and website at trcpodcast.com for general inquiries or to send a topic or parody suggestion email info at trcpodcast.com Help support the show by leaving a review on iTunes and liking us on Facebook. Follow us on Twitter at TRC underscore podcast.